to be able to hear that and uh, hopefully it will enlarge our vision, enlarge our understanding of the Lord's work in different parts of the world. He's calling on us perhaps to look uh, beyond just the confines of our own world, beyond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in different churches and in different parts of the world. So welcome to Mark, the Holy Spirit and be with us today. So as we prepare our hearts for this communion service, we take our orders of service, turn to page one, and we'll say together the prayer of preparation. We say it again. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires know, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we come to our prayers of penitence. We take a moment to be still. We invite the Lord by his Holy Spirit to come to search our hearts and minds. We look back over the week or the weeks that have been. There may today be things that we regret, things we'd like to say sorry for. Let's take a moment to be still. So we say to Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. 
We have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate thought. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all good works, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, Julie has a few words to tell us, a few words for the children, but for all of us about children in our services at this point in time. Good morning. I did bring Harris to make sure I've got some children here this morning. <laughs> it's, all that nice. it's lovely to see some others. Thank you ever so much for coming. Um, a bit of a funny way into my talk this morning, but today is safeguarding Sunday, which I had completely forgotten in the hurly burly on the safeguarding. So, a big shout out to the team because it's been an incredibly busy time at the moment. It's not our normal safeguarding, it's not in our comfort zone, it's not in our experience or in a different realm. So there's been an awful lot of work going on. And one of the discussions last week was between Beverly, Jeanette, and I about what we do about children in the church. Do we run sessions with the added complication of bubbles and all the rest of it? And we had a great big think about this, prayed very hard about it, and thought perhaps the best thing to do is to continue in welcoming children into our services, but provide activities. So Trish has emailed out to all the families. We've named packs for some of the children already, and what was lovely was we had guests already who would be just name those before their mums replied, which is really nice. So from now onwards, there are packs at the back of church for the children with activities in. There are some activities that are ongoing, and each week, activities will be added by the person doing the children's slot, and they'll be added by the Wednesday before. I had to get organised last weekend, which I know is a worry, hearing that from me. Um, so last weekend, I sorted out the activities for this week, so that the contents are quarantined and safe for the children. So if you know any families, please do encourage them to come along, or they can pop in and take stuff out of packs before the Wednesday, so that if they'd like their children to catch up, have something to do at home, they can also do that. So it is really lovely to see you here, and we do welcome you, and we wish we were running groups, but it's so complicated at the moment that we'd like to continue welcoming you in church. So thank you very much for coming. And you look like you're busy and enjoying them. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for Julie? <laughs> Julie is our fantastic safeguarding officer. Has been for, I don't know how many years, Julie. It's probably about 10. I think we're heading to 10. And also one of our key children's leaders. We can usually just talk <clears throat> to Julie for all she does. So real appreciation for Julie this morning. Thank you. So I think we will stand, or we will remain seated, the choir will stand and sing the glory as we give our thanks and praise to the Lord this morning.
the church's prayer for this Sunday. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Come to our readings from the Bible, please. Testament reading today is from Isaiah chapter 25 verses 1 to 9. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the need in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of the aliens like a heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the New Testament reading today is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love, and long for, my joy, my crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, 
with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thank you, God. seated as the choir leads us in our gospel hymn, let all the world in every corner sing. to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. Well, the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to the slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. He said to him, How is it that David, by the Spirit, 
sorry. <laughs> he said to them, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, find him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I'm going to invite Mike to come and uh, do something of his work with the name. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Just this slightly. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Um, so, my name is Mike, I'm the Chief Executive of Mosaic Middle East, more of which later. We're going to just show a short video in a moment, which is from our website. It really just gives the context of our work in the Middle East, give you an idea. It's um, basically introducing the new charity. That last scripture there is a very telling one. Um, the candle burning there is uh, a piece of film that we took. Relevant, pertinent, powerful scripture to sum up a lot of what we're about as an organization. And we believe that God has his hand on the, his people in the Middle East, and we believe that he will not let that smouldering wick be snuffed out. It said earlier in the video, a million Christians have fled Iraq since 2003. If you think about this, originally the most accurate census figures, and census figures were notoriously problematic under the Saddam Hussein regime, but the most accurate figures were that there were around about 1.3 million uh, Christians in Iraq before then, and a million have left. 
So this is 80%. It's actually a larger percentage than any other ethnic or religious group anywhere in the world in that period, including people like the Rohingya, that we've all heard so much about in the media, and rightly so. But how often have you heard about the million Christians who fled Iraq? Probably some of you have, because you're Christians yourself, so maybe you're aware of these issues. But most of the media do not report this. So we try to highlight this. For example, this week, we've written to the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, about the situation facing Christians in Iraq. And 17 other organizations have signed our letter that we've initiated, including Open Doors and uh, Release International, Aid to the Church in Need, the huge Catholic Aid Agency, the Evangelical Alliance, and many others, including actually the Humanist Society, believe it or not. So we are trying to stand up for the Christians of Iraq. Why are we doing that? Because we've seen for ourselves the suffering of our Christian brothers and sisters. But we don't only work with Christians. We work to support other persecuted minorities like the Yazidi people who suffered a terrible genocide under ISIS. Some of you will know about that. And other groups, minorities in Iraq and other parts of the Middle East. And we seek also to be peacemakers and to bring people together. When I was last in Baghdad, for example, I spent a whole afternoon with Ayatollah Hussein al-Sadr, one of the top Shia clerics in Iran, and it spoke about um, our common uh, interest in peace. I may not share his faith or his beliefs, his religious beliefs, but I found him to be a man who was a genuine peacemaker, of which there are few in a place like Iran, so very important to build those bridges. So we, we make those connections with people. Last year, we were in 10 Downing Street lobbying uh, in that context for the people of, of Iraq. And why are we doing this? Because we want to see those people protected. More practically, at a practical level, at a grassroots level, we seek to bring restoration, hope, help and healing, as we put it, to individuals. I'm going to just talk briefly about some of those individuals now, if we could look at the, the photographs. I think I've got about four or five photographs to show you of people that were specifically trying to help and have helped. Because we believe, as it says in Psalm 23, in that wonderful verse, he restores my soul. There's many damaged people in the Middle East. We here are facing our own challenges, of course. But I can tell you, this is nothing for the challenges faced there. So this, uh, this first photograph is a family we met in the Virgin Mary refugee camp in Baghdad. They had fled in the middle of the night on the 6th of August, 2014, when ISIS swept across the north of Iraq and took over the whole of that area. This terrorizing army who cut people's heads off, threw people off buildings, and basically drove out the Christians and the Yazidis from that whole region. 120,000 Christians fled on one night. And this family were one of those families. This guy, if I remember rightly, was the manager in a metal pressing factory. Um, so not an insignificant job, and they had a nice home, They've lost everything. And they've ended up living in a porter cabin in Baghdad. So we've just recently discovered, we can go back to that first photograph, sorry. Just one bit, one back further. There we go. His name's Anwar. When he came to Baghdad, he managed to get a job in a liquor store, as he called it. Um, and when I interviewed him, he said, one day a man came to the liquor store and put a gun to his head and said, if you don't leave this job, you'll be killed. Basically, because of the, um, sort of, shall we say, 
radical Islam um, being against the drinking of alcohol, who are trying to shut down alcohol off licenses and so on, of which there are some in Baghdad. So this guy put a gun to his head if you don't leave your job, you'll be killed. In, in fear, he left his job. He gave up that job. His friend stayed. He'd also been threatened. The following week, he was killed. So this man then, he's, he's been languishing in the refugee camp in Baghdad ever since. We found out recently he's now got a little stall selling sunflower seeds. That's how he's trying to make a living with his family. We go to the next photograph. It's a wonderful uplifting story of a young woman called Marlene. You may have noticed her on the short films I showed. Um, and I sp spoken to her a number of times at different occasions over the last two or three years. And she had a terrible uh, experience as a young woman when her father was kidnapped along with the priest um, the local priest, and they were both murdered. And they were left lying in the street of a neighboring village in the north of Iraq, this was. And her father had a sign put around his neck saying, if anybody moves this body, you'll be killed. And they learned about this. They didn't know what had happened to, to her father, the family, and they learned about this. And obviously were terrified of the circumstances. But her 17-year-old brother went in the middle of the night to collect his father's body in fear that he might be killed. She's had a terrible series of traumas happen to her, this woman. They fled um, when ISIS attacked some time later. And uh, she said that 23 of them were living in one tent at one point. Her and her, her family, her extended family, uh, with her brother and his family. And uh, eventually they got out of Iraq. And we met her when she was a refugee in Jordan. That's when we first met her. And she told us this story. She told it just almost matter-of-factly, sitting on a sofa in this very rundown little apartment that we supported the rent on. And uh, uh, with her husband and two young children, with no real emotion, I suppose that was how she was dealing with it. But then as we start to ask her a couple of questions then, and, and, and there were some tears, and we were, all of us in tears, listening to her. But she said, one amazing thing, God never forgot us. And this woman, the next time we saw her, she was in this church in Jordan, actually run by a Korean couple, a Pentecostal church in Jordan, which is quite something. And she was leading the worship, this young woman with a group of other women on a little stage like this, at the front of the church with 150 people leading the worship, a face full of joy. And thank God, since then, she's managed to get emig to emigrate to Australia. And I'm friends with her on Facebook. And I can see her and her children playing on a beach in Australia. This is quite moving. And this is one of the people that we've tried to help. I'm sorry, I'm taking a bit longer than I planned. If you go to the next photograph. Now this young woman, Ravine, she is one of the reasons we're called Mosaic Middle East. Because she was in, I think it might have even been the same town as Marlene, but one of the towns in the north of Iraq, in the Nineveh Plain. Nineveh, as in the Bible, you know, Jonah and all that. The ruins of that city are in on the edge of Mosul, which is the second biggest city in Iraq, or was before it was destroyed in the war. 
And um, the Nineveh Plain is to the east and north of Mosul, a big plain where it's an agricultural area and there's lots of Christian villages all over it or were before ISIS destroyed most of it. And this lady, this young woman, Ravine, came from Karakosh, which is the largest Christian town in that area. She again fled in the middle of the night on the 6th of August 2014. And she ended up in Jordan, in a city called Madaba, famous for its mosaics. And she was taught by a Catholic church project to make mosaics. And she made this mosaic for our voluntary center for us. And this is how we met her. We met her designing the mosaic. We met her after she'd made the mosaic. We met her when she came to the opening of the Olive Tree Center. And here I am last October at the opening of our Olive Tree Center in Madaba in Jordan, a center for refugees to support them in many, many different ways, trauma counseling, kids work, trauma therapy for children, art therapy, art, sorry, music, um, English teaching, cooking, cooking Iraqi food, all sorts of different projects go on at this center. So that was wonderful. And to see the creativity, the new creative era of this young woman's life is a real thrill. One of the reasons why we're called Mosaic Middle East. And the other reason, as alluded to in Beverly's fantastic and excellent summary in the little leaflet you put in with the service sheet, Beverly. Um, Another reason is because of the concept of broken pieces, broken lives, and broken communities being put together again into a beautiful picture. This sums up what we call mosaic at least. Can we go to the next photograph? Here are some of the women in their traditional Iraqi Christian costumes, handmade at the opening of the Olive Tree Center. And if you look carefully on the right, for example, there's Ravine, you can see communion cup, a church, a white dove, all the symbols of Christianity. Go to the last photograph, I think it's the last one. At the end of the short film you saw um, was Salim, this man. We met him, we had lunch with him and his family, and they incredibly generous, as often people are in difficult circumstances and poor, poor communities. And, uh, and then he suddenly started talking in Arabic. And we had a translator, I don't speak Arabic, only a few words. We had a translator with us who interpreted. And we filmed him, we quickly um, we had some film guys with us, filmed him. And he said what was at the end of that film. He had lost everything. He and his family had fled Iraq, they were in Jordan, and they'd lost their business and beautiful home. He was saying, if you'd only seen Karakosh before ISIS, it was beautiful. Um, and then he said, but we must forgive. And he said, as Christians, we must love everybody, even enemies. It was a really challenging thing when we think about how much we complain about life and they've lost everything and this was his, his comment. Very inspiring and we, we've included it in our two of our films for that reason. So what about the dreaded COVID-19? The challenges in the Middle East continue. So if you take Baghdad, for example, the clinic, we fund a clinic in Baghdad, which has about 2,000 patients a month. At the moment, it's reduced about 1,000 patients a month. Two of the doctors have been infected with COVID. The husband of the female pediatric doctor died from COVID. It's very, very challenging. There's many, many cases in Baghdad. And, uh, it's very challenging for them. In the north, um, we're finding that we, we're having to provide hygiene packs for the refugees 
So in the refugee camps, there's thousands and thousands of people still in refugee camps in the north of Iraq. So we, over the last seven months, have been providing hygiene packs of basic cleaning items um, for thousands of refugees there. In, uh, in Jordan, they've had a military-imposed curfew with the military on the streets arresting people if they go out of their houses when there's a lockdown. They have kind of between three and five day lockdowns at a time when you can't even leave your house to go to the local shop. Um, so very challenging there. But they've got that all on top of all this trauma that they've experienced. So I would just we can just briefly go, to, if it's possible, just have a look at our website. If you have a chance, look at our website, mosaicmiddleeast.org, and you'll understand more about our work, how we're trying to do that. What it says in Psalm 23, he restores my soul. So we're trying to bring soul restoration. I often say to people, if we can be in the soul restoration business, that would be a fantastic business to be in. And we've done that with people like Marlene, who, as I say, two weeks ago, she sent me photographs on Facebook of her and her children playing on the beach in Australia after all the trauma that she'd been through. We've managed to help her on that route. And in many other ways, this ravine, the young woman, out of the trauma of Iraq, she's then become this incredibly creative person making mosaics in Madaba. And so many other examples I could talk about if I had time. But on our website, under stories section, you'll see lots of stories. We've actually got about 20 more that we're going to gradually put on there. They're ready to, with the click of a button, they can be on the website. But we didn't want to flood the website with 30 stories. So I think there's about 10 or 12 on there. That's wonderful, thank you for that. And then it's also just, there's two things I'd like to draw your attention to at the top where it says how to help. There's the obvious one about, please can you give us a donation? And on the, on the give section, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, but on the pray section, we've created a wonderful, lots of people love this, a lovely prayer page with a burning candle, that's from Baghdad. And if you click on enter the prayer space, then you'll get a series of different prayers. And, um, and then you can click on, we're going to put more of these up as time goes on, an individual prayer. And then it, it takes you through how you might like to pray. And then you might like this, you might not. If you, if you hold down the amen button, you get the doves floating up. <laughs> so uh, it's just a way of engaging people in prayer. And if you finish, you can see that's the 225th person who's prayed for that particular prayer. So it encourages people. So just some ways that you can engage with our work. I hope you'll want to support, continue to support us. Thank you for your support, by the way, uh, in prayer and financially if you're able to. Because, I mean, you can tell I am very emotional about the work that we do. It's a wonderful job, very inspiring, but also very emotional. And I'm often sat in tears with people when I'm out in the Middle East. Um, do ask me questions at the end. And I'm sorry if I've gone a little bit over the time, but if you'd like to join with us in bringing that restoration, he restore it my soul then I'd be so happy. Thank you very much. Thank you to Mike so much for that. It's really inspiring to hear. I just want to chat as we have been supporting financially for a little while. I just want to hear just much more detail and depth that brings it to life for us. So thank you. So do take Mike's offer uh, finding out a bit more. At four o'clock at our tea time church we'll also be focusing on Mosaic Middle East and uh, praying some of those prayers and Carolyn's going to be talking as well about her own call to serve overseas as a medical missionary so that theme is going to run through today so uh, please do make the most of it. So in the light of that I'm going to ask Richard whether he might lead us 
in prayer, but you've just been our link person really for a no need for someone. That's what you to keep us in prayer. Today I've chosen as our theme for our prayers the word mosaic to reflect the name of the organisation whose operations are headed by our preacher today. Mosaic being the name of the small marble pieces called tesserae, which form the wonderful floors and wall patterns known both in the ancient world and in today's culture. Father, we pray to you in faith and ask that you will hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Yeah. Loving Lord, we meet here together in worship, giving thanks as after the end of lockdown, we are now able to do so. Others will be joining us in other ways, so that together we can offer you our praise, prayers and thanksgiving. We recall the words of scripture used in this service, but first used by King David as he prepared the materials for the building of the first temple in Jerusalem. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. And among the materials he assembled, gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, and so on, he also collected stones for mosaic work, precious stones of every sort, and marble in plenty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So let us give God the glory for the work carried out in the Middle East by MME. We pray for the rector of St. George's Church in Baghdad, for the exiled Christians hoping to return to the historic plain of Nineveh following the demise of the ISIS terrorists. For Helena, the Jordan country director, responsible for the exile from Iraq in Jordan. For all those who work in the St. George's Clinic in Baghdad, and for those who work on the MME Nineveh support program called SEED. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We've also been asked to pray, as you've heard from Michael already, for Iraqi Christians and those of minority beliefs not yet feeling safe in returning to their original homes. This follows the Iraqi Prime Minister calling them back last August, but in the absence of jobs, security and hope, they say they can't return. So we pray for that letter which Mike has mentioned to Dominic Rao, urging the UK government to spur on the Iraqi government to take steps to provide essential assistance for those wishing to return. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the building of the first temple in Jerusalem was completed by King David's successor, King Solomon, Scripture records that Solomon prayed to God for wisdom and knowledge, that he might lead his people. Let us now pray for that same wisdom and knowledge to be given to the leaders of the nations, for our own government as it strives to contain the impact of the COVID virus. For those contending to be elected president of the United States. For the leaders of the governments of Azerbaijan and Armenia, giving thanks for the ceasefire in the Nagorno-Karabakh area. Pray that this will be sustained. We pray for the peoples of Syria and Ukraine, still affected by war, and for the United Nations as it continues to broker peace in so many countries in the world. Father God, we pray that we may be ambassadors of the gospel of peace, that our mission both as individuals and as a church will be to share our knowledge by you with others, so that all may live together in love and fellowship. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. <laughs> we pray also for our local community and for the communities in Iraq. 
that in the same way as the broken individual pieces of marble in a mosaic come together in a most wonderful way. So may the lives of all um, with them who are in contact be transformed. So there's an image of beauty and wholeness made as if by miracle appear. We pray for our local amenities, for our emergency services, for our schools, universities and colleges. But we especially hope before God those who are um, unable to support themselves and who are cared for. The carers who work in nursing and care homes, for the nurses and medical workers who meet so many in need of treatment away from hospitals and surgeries. And in our cycle of prayer this week, we pray for those who live or work in Palmer's Lodge. Pentries Avenue, Baltimore Road, and Powell Close. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We hold before our loving Father those who need our support in prayer, owing to illness or frailty. So we pray for the continued recovery of Michael and Sheila, and give our support to Rosemary and Julie. We also pray for Anne, Pauline Rosemary, Doris Joy, and we give thanks for the work of all those employed in the medical and nursing professions. We pray that they will be kept safe in this time of epidemic, as well as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. We close our prayers by giving thanks for the lives of any known to us who have died recently. We pray for true comfort to attend on friends and family of the bereaved. We also call to mind those whose anniversaries of death at this time, naming Pauline Dean, Phyllis Jarrett, Arthur Savage, and Mary Walford. We pray too for their families and friends. So we pray that may our lives be so directed towards God and the love of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we may prepare ourselves for the praise and worship of God in heaven, where his kingdom, power, and glory reign for eternity. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we stand together now to share the Lord's peace with one another. <clears throat> we are the body of Christ, and in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We offer one another a sign of peace. So pray there'll be news for your good. Do be seated as the choir leads us in our offer three words. The breath of life comes sweeping to us. <laughs>
yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own degree. So that book, let's return to page 11, and we'll say Eucharistic Prayer H together this week. The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We will live in the to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embrace us as your children and, and welcome us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice of sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave me thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood be the And as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in us. Our risen Lord. And with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven.
your name we pray. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave to you, his blood which he shed for us. We can drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith. We pray. I would invite you now to stand, and I will bring round the bread uh, as part of our service now. Please stand.
We praise and thank you, O Christ, for this sacred feast. For here we receive you. Here the memory of your passion is renewed. Here our minds are filled with grace. And here a pledge of future glory is given when we shall feast at that table where you reign with all your saints forever. Amen. Let's say together the prayer of thanksgiving, the prayer after communion, and on page 16 of our booklets. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be the living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just one or two notices which you'll find in the new sheet for today. Just to say, if you felt yourself moved by this service today and would like to become part of our missions group, I know Peter and Carolyn and Richard amongst a lot of some new members, and of course people often when they're young to serve us overseas. Carolyn's going to talk about that later. But if you're stirred and you'd like to help, uh, support that group and our overseas mission. Then please do have a word with Peter or Richard or Carolyn later today. Uh, just looking ahead to say next Sunday is, uh, is St. Luke's Day and we're having services of wholeness and healing, uh, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 4 o'clock. And if you'd like to come uh, for individual prayer, then at 4 o'clock do come. There'll be an opportunity to be prayed for, laying on the hands for healing and wholeness, and bring friends, relatives, anyone who might find with that ministry. That's next Sunday. At, each of our three services. Um, various other things, um, pilgrim course, second course is finished, the third one uh, you can sign up for now if you'd like to do that and buy the third book. It's been a very wonderful time together, so do join in if you'd like to. Which is updating the family list, so lots of things. So have a good read, and we're uh, coming towards the end of our service, but have a good read of the notices, the spots going on. And finally, just thank you again to Mike, very inspiring. Uh, an inspiring talk today. Yes. And Jim gave me. Oh, yes. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, I know. Bucket bottoms. Sorry, I'm Bucket bottoms. Sorry. Bucket pants. We had a lovely day um, yesterday. We went and dug up the veggie patch in the garden. Alan was seen wandering down Vicarage Gate with a huge, <laughs> huge load of um, stones in a wheelbarrow. We had to go and rescue the wheelbarrow and <laughs> Alan at the same time. Anyway, we've dug it up, we've stuck ponds in, uh, buckets in, and we've got all sorts of stuff. We've got the hard, um, the wonderful stones and everything around it. Right. Next weekend, I think uh, we, we've got a before picture. I'm sorry, this is all Judy, she's done everything, it's amazing. Never mind. Um, we've got, next weekend we'd like to put some plants in. If you have any plants that are a little overgrown and looking a bit too big and bushy in your uh, garden, particularly anything that's a flowering plant that bees and other insects would really love. If you fancied splitting it up a little bit and bringing part of it, obviously roots intact, and leaving it in the vicarage garden, uh, probably before Thursday would be really great. Then we'll stick those in around the ponds and we're just creating a really beautiful habitat for wildlife. So the shout is for, for living greenery, not pond life, this not pond plants this week, but just things that we can dig around. Thank you very much. Lovely Alison, thank you. I'm glad we didn't forget that. So pocket ponds and vicarage, and you're very welcome to come and have a look, see the work so far. And hopefully once it's finished, I'll put some benches down there and you can come and sit there and enjoy the beauty of the wildlife. Uh, so thank you much to Alison and to all those who took part in that book pond bonanza yesterday, a huge group of great people. Is there anything else I've missed? I like to hear it. <laughs> well, thank you. So I'll hand over to our choir once more for our final hymn, um, We Have a Gospel to Proclaim. <laughs>
wants to uh, come to say uh, just about to say the final blessing and after that we need to leave we're not allowed to uh from a safety point of view we need to leave at the end of the service so if we start leaving from the back rows first uh, i think that would be the way and henrietta will be there to tell you and so the peace of god which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of god and of his son jesus christ our Lord, and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be among you and remain with you always amen go in peace to love and serve the lord in the name of christ amen